There was an angel that emerged from the cloud. Fire pouring out of its face, its body covered in blood, and its name was... Yeldabaoth. You were talking about a snake with the head of a lion! I've seen them again. I've seen them just like Sophia. They are demons. That's what the kingdom is, and the cult will allow them in. Jerry. When the cycle is completed before the temple gate, the Lonely King will come with all the stars and fulfill what was announced. It's the fucking apocalypse, Gian. There are minor gods called Archons, who can cross the threshold. Supposedly, when they enter our world, they must inhabit a human body, which is a vessel. They cannot live outside it. Not for very long. I read members of Gnostic sects offered their bodies as a release from the material world. Happy heresies and welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome to Aeon Bite Gnostic Radio. My name is Miel Connor, your host and Pompidus of Gnosis. A special show for thee. And my intro will be short as there is a ton of Aeonic content even though the topic is literally arconic. Yes, you shining crazy diamonds. These, quote, best of or, quote, greatest hits shows do very well and are very well received. I would check out my past ones on Hermeticism and All About Sophia. I thought it would be time for a podcast on our favorite Bond villains, the Archons with a lot of Yaldi Baldi and Fallen Angels to season it real horror show. Get ready for a thrilling ride with some fantastic astral guests. First two guests will be for both subs and non-subs. Robert Price leads the way with a historical and mythological overview of the Archons. From traditional Judaism to classical Gnosticism. Then the awesome Mark Cordova discusses the Archons from the Nag Hammadi Library point of view, with some fascinating theories. For all subs, I'll provide part of my interview with filmmaker and author Jay Wiedner. He focuses more on modern times and Archons as mind parasites thrilling stuffy stuff. Then on a parallel Archon spectrum, author and mystic Frank DeVita discusses the extraterrestrial origins of the Demiurge and his Archons, including their endgame for this galaxy. We'll pivot back to classical Gnosticism, focusing on astrology and astrotheology with scholar April DeConnick. Lots of star portals and Egyptian star maps, I say, I say. We'll end with some of my content as I tie it all together and tie ancient Archon forces to modern Archon manifestations in popular culture and society in general. More than a show, this is a nice mini course of many hours that will grant you some insights into the always shifting Archons that rule our cosmos. In the end, they are always in the corner of our eye and embedded deep in our psyche. But we can at least undo their code and untangle their tentacles. At least enough to rise and embrace Sophia and the Aeons led us to an odyssey in understanding the powers and principalities. Again, first my friend and academic, Robert Price. Some people lose their faith because heaven shows them too little. But how many people lose their faith because heaven shows them too much? Years later, of all the gospels I learned in seminary school, a verse from St. Paul stays with me. It is perhaps the strangest passage in the Bible in which he writes, Even now in heaven there were angels carrying savage weapons. Did you ever notice how in the Bible, whenever God needed to punish someone, or make an example, or whenever God needed a killing, he sent an angel? Did you ever wonder what a creature like that must be like? 
A whole existence spent praising your God, but always with one wing dipped in blood. Would you ever really want to see an angel? Uh, most people assume that the archons were sort of drawn out from uh, Paul's writings and these sort of uh, mysterious rulers and princes that he talks about and then sort of developed by the Gnostics. Is that basically it, Bob? Uh, that's uh, an oversimplification. It's like connecting the dots, leaving out a few dots. Uh, I mean, who knows, right? But it, it occurs to me that the stuff you find in the Nag Hammadi texts with a, a committee of creators and so on, uh, the uh, the different versions of the Eden story in uh, the Testimony of Truth, the Origin of the World, the Hypothesis of the Archons, and so on, are uh, either they're at least picking up on the polytheism clearly implied in Genesis, uh, let us make man, uh, and uh, behold, the man has become like one of us, and, and so forth, that there were there must have been more than one divine entity involved in the whole Garden of Eden scenario, the creation of Adam and Eve, and so on. Now, it could be that they're speculating, who could that have been? Uh, yeah, that's fine, but they're, um, the, the fact remains that this does underlie the text of Genesis, that there were several uh, entities, a and uh, so does the notion that God is lying, or gods or whoever is lying to Adam and Eve about the, the fruit being deadly poison. And why? Well, because he doesn't want the humans to get uh, his or their prerogatives. I mean, I don't think, you know, you got to try to, if you don't like that, in Genesis, you have to do quite a bit of footwork to get out of that, and, and none of it's convincing. So I think they're seeing what is there. They may be giving their own names to it, but even there, I wouldn't think so, because, of course, archon is a generic term, the princes, the rulers, and so forth. Uh, well, um, that's, uh, who else would they be? I mean, this this whole thing is like there's their spin on it, but it's part of this remote Old Testament idea that um, there are many gods who rule the, the various nations of the world. And uh, in fact, the nations were numbered so that each one of these gods or sons of Elohim would, would have a, a, a nation to rule. So there are rulers. I mean, it's not just angels in the Old Testament. They're rulers of nations. Uh, the, Daniel mentions this kind of thing. Uh, the was uh, Gabriel appears late to Daniel and said, I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but I had to battle the prince of Persia, well, the archon of Persia, the, the ruling spirit. And uh, so it seems to me, that, and of course, the, uh, the, the fall of the sons of God, who the heck ever they were, right? Well, they, they had to be these, these uh, lesser gods, and they mated with mortal women. And you see all of this stuff uh, elaborated in Jewish apo uh, apocryphal, pseudepigraphical works. It was common belief, and that was easy to harmonize with Hellenistic ideas of the stoichia, the intermediate elemental spirits that the Stoics believed in. And so uh, there isn't all that much in the fundamental conception of the archons and uh, their rule and all that that wasn't kind of common property in, in the ancient world. The Pauline language seems to reflect it. But if, if one were to say that uh, rather than give rise to it, because if you said, ah, oh, the Gnostics just got it from Ephesians or something, which they do quote, but if that's where they got it from, then you got to ask, well, what did, what did Ephesians mean by it? Uh, clearly, I mean, even if you never heard of any Gnostic texts, it's very clear you're talking about principalities and powers, rulers of this age or this world, and who dominate the, the sons of wrath and all. I mean, mostly it's, it's spelled out there anyway. You've got the Gnostic Pleroma in, uh, in Colossians. You've got the three categories of human beings in 1 Corinthians. And it seems to me uh, the, uh, the Pauline material is just uh, commenting on a pre-existing tradition, which the Gnostics have inherited too, whether before or after the Pauline epistles. And Bob, do you see, or is there a name for this type of literature you find in On the Origins of the World and the Hypostasis of the Archons, where they just uh, reinterpret Genesis? Well, uh, some of it is found in 
Jewish and somewhat Christianized Jewish pseudepigrapha, books of Enoch and Jubilees and so forth, and they they often do not have uh, the notion of a spiritual illumination that you find in the Gnostic texts, but it's in a sense it's all apocalyptic in that it's revelation literature. Some of the Nagamati texts just take for granted, well, yeah, here, here's the truth. Well, where could they have gotten it? Uh, probably from some sort of revelation also. It, it, uh, you, you've already got it, the, the fundamentals of it, in the Garden of Eden story. So, and, and as for the knowledge, well, you really even have that too, because the Jewish pseudepigraphical stories have the sons of God giving knowledge to the, the fledgling humans they kind of spin the thing in a negative way so that they give knowledge of uh, uh, death-dealing weapons for men and uh, the arts of cosmetic and seduction to women. But uh, as Margaret Barker argues, this was probably a bigger deal in ancient Israel than we would guess from something like the Testament to the Twelve Patriarchs, which are more likely preserving uh, and in a more unedited form, what is taken for granted by the canonical writers. Uh, so uh, even all of that is to say that uh, it's really part of the warp and woof of um, of uh, Jewish literature and comes from the same source, I, I think. It, it isn't really a separate special bunch of books that somehow leaked into the tradition. So basically, as I've heard, especially fundamentalists like to say, well, these texts were anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic. What is your answer to that? Well, it is possible to read it that way, but uh, I think that uh, it's more of a Jewish reaction to what some mystical Jews began to consider oversimplification and a kind of dumbed-down editing and and domestication of the stuff. Uh, it's those who uh, are rejecting and reviling the archons who lied to Adam and Eve. Uh, again, they're getting it from the Bible in the first instance, and it seems to me that it, you'd have to ask, who are they portraying with uh, the image of gods who want to stymie human knowledge and progress? Well, that's what the old rationalists used to call priestcraft, and it's. I think they're talking about, uh, it's like traditional Catholics despising Vatican II, or uh, Louis Farrakhan despising uh, the, the reforms made by Warith Dean Muhammad after the death of Elijah Muhammad. It's, uh, it's a partisanship for a repressed and condemned belief that was once very common, and uh, and these people are not given up on it. So it isn't anti-Jewish so much as it's uh, against people who have emasculated what the writers consider the true biblical religion. These guys aren't Marcionites. Like at the end of uh, On the Origin of the World, it says that the writings of the prophets, and they seem to mean the Jewish prophets, are key to uh, the coming apocalypse. And why would you even get into, why would you reinterpret all of these Jewish sources if you were simply a Marcionite, right? And if you simply rejected uh, the Old Testament, and if you were anti-Jewish, why would you be rejecting the Old Testament? So it seems to me that's just a convenient oversimplification. Exactly. And uh, to, going back to the nature of the Archons, the Archons are these sort of godly beings, uh, these cosmic bureaucrats, but they're also this amazing bullying rapist. Uh, mm. where, what is their template? Do you think they just, uh, these writers saw what the Romans were doing to other cultures and just made them into celestial beings? Uh, well, I don't know. It's possible that uh, since... The thing with uh, the Archons lusting after the spiritual Eve and her uh, getting away from her by turning into a tree, apparently the tree of knowledge, and uh, the uh, the uh, Archons raping a, uh, a cloudy uh, mirage Eve, it could be like a lot of this more, more clearly parallels elements of Greek myth 
where Hera was rescued but got assaulted in a her her uh, her cloudy form i think it says uh, a simulacrum was uh, was molested by whoever it was i've forgotten now uh, so that seems directly reflected but also Daphne who has to run from the lustful uh, uh, urges of Apollo and uh, outwits him by somehow becoming a tree. And uh, if that is so close, you got to figure, yeah, this is syncretism, though even that may be too, uh, too artificial a way of viewing it. It may just be shared mythemes. Uh, like, the, I mean, Genesis abounds in stories parallel to uh, ancient uh, Greek myth. So maybe their heritage too. But I have a hunch that the ultimate well, also, let me just say, the idea of the the archons as rapists is uh, just a slight variant of an old Jewish idea that even the Orthodox rabbis propounded, that uh, where did Cain get his uh, his evil nature? Why was he a murderer? Well, he must, I mean, he's, he's so close to the creation of God. Uh, where did this bad element come from? As the church lady would say, could it be Satan? Uh, and uh, yeah, it was. He must have had uh, the sa- satanic DNA. And uh, First John comes pretty darn close to saying that. And so I think that um, it's, again, an inherited notion. It's trying to explain the origin of evil in humanity, especially since later on in on the origin of the world, they talk about how humanity is divided into these different groups groups, these different strata, and what makes the difference between them? Well, they all have these souls that have, have been projected into them uh, by the, the good guys, uh, Pista Sophia and so on. But uh, they were, th- these people were, these early humans were molested by the archons too, though with varying degrees of success, so that um, the, uh, the the real slobs, the immoral, the uh, the evil, they are predominated by uh, the, the sperm, the seed, the DNA, as we would say, of the archons. But uh, many of the others uh, were immune to their influence, and that explains the mix, they say, in the church, though I, I think they mean the whole human race. Um, and they're trying to explain why in uh, the congregation you have people like them, the Sethian Gnostics who know what, they're, what the deal is, and uh, other people that don't and would persecute them if they knew who they were. But uh, it's, it's theodicy. How did we get this intermixing of uh, evil uh, in a world that, um, or in, among souls who were planted by Pista Sophia and so on? It's not completely consistent, or at least I can't follow it com- consistently in every place, but I suspect it's just what the whole Gnostic thing is, uh, ultimately a theodicy. If there's, a, if there's a good God way up there, how did the world get as it is, how did people get as they are? It must be the uh, DNA from the archons or Satan or whoever else. I tend not to, th- to look for politics under every bush, a kind of a theological McCarthyism. Uh, like I know a lot, it's really a uh, big fad today to say that Paul had prophetic uh, knowledge of post-colonial leftism, and so he uh, he was uh, when he, he's talking about Rome, he really means the United States and and George Bush. I think that's just a <laughs> typical liberal uh, manipulation of the text to make it a ventriloquist dummy. And speaking of archons, both the origin of the world and hypostasis have the story of the enthronement of Sabaoth, the redeemed Mm. archon who gets put into heaven. Is this a story that was going around, or what do you know of uh, Sabaoth? This is really one of the most striking things in it. Why would they redeem this one, uh, the son of Ialdabaoth, the Demiurge? And they kind of split him into two characters, it seems to me. In fact, they used to say Ialdabaoth is a slight garbling of Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of Hosts, or whatever. And they even bring up that derivation only with uh, Sabaoth, that uh, he is known as the Lord of Powers or Lord of Hosts or whatever. That is interesting to me, as if they're trying to say 
you know, the creation isn't all that bad. It isn't simply, they talk about Yaldabaoth as the ultimate creator. But, uh, the, uh, but the world we know and the heavens and all that stuff were made by Sabaoth after he was reformed. Are they kind of mitigating the pessimism of the original idea? It seems sort of like it is, especially when it says all this happened according to the will of Pista Sophia and, and uh, the ultimate father and all that. It, I don't know, but uh, to me, that looks like this kind of typical reassimilation degree by degree to the social order against which the radical movement first repudiated and, and differentiated themselves. Uh, I think like Marcionism seems to be a kind of uh, going back some steps toward the world that, uh, that Gnosticism had simply rejected. And I wonder if that's what's happening here. Uh, but I don't know. There are probably better interpretations of it. But. Yeah, what's also striking in the hypostasis of the Archons is you don't have a Jesus figure. In fact, you don't even have a Seth figure. Somehow the uh, the Gnostic revealers is Elilith and uh, hmm. Norea. Why do you, why do you think this is, Bob? I don't know. My guess is that like, and where did they get the idea that Norea incinerated the Ark? Uh, that's got to mean something, and, and apparently there were loads of Norea texts that we don't even have that are mentioned in the, these texts, uh, and uh, that always sets off my uh, suspicions that we have a, a kind of compilation and harmonization of very different original versions of Gnosticism, like why are there different uh, Sophia analogs as well, some of them in the same text? Uh, why do they di bother differentiating uh, Zoe or Zoe from uh, from uh, Sophia and all that? Uh, what's the difference between her and the, the uh, spiritual Eve? And I uh, sort of suspect uh, maybe each of these was the analogous figure in a different uh, a, a form of the religion, just like all the uh, the goddesses in the Olympian pantheon are really pretty much versions of each other. There's not that much difference. Or the three goddesses of Mecca. Uh, they're really pretty much the same character and do the same thing. And so you wonder if uh, people have groups, clans, sects, uh, religions met one another as their membership perhaps was shrinking and like modern congregations do saying, you know, these people believe pretty much what we do, though they're, they, they use different names. What the heck? Let's put them all together. And uh, maybe this one's the, uh, the, the daughter of that one. That was Albrecht Alt's view of where you got the gods of the fathers in Genesis. Uh, that uh, the God of Abraham, the, the uh, fear of Isaac, and the, the mighty one of Jacob were uh, tribal totems, sort of, uh, for different groups, which eventually joined together and established a hierarchy. The oldest or biggest of the groups was the ones who were the Abraham uh, people, moon god worshippers, since that's what Abraham seems to be, and uh, Isaac, sun god worshippers, and um, Jacob, another moon god, they all got together and figured, okay, there's a genealogy. This is the ranking of the, the clans and their authorities. And so the gods were separate, but then they said, oh, what the heck, they're all the same. Forget the sun and moon thing. I suspect you can see that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, evolution by accumulation in, um, in the Nag Hammadi text, which otherwise seems needlessly redundant, I mean, just pointlessly, sort of like listening to me, I guess. It's, uh, uh, it, it, you don't need this much of it. So why did they, they uh, stuff it with all these equivalent demiurges and, and so forth? I don't know, but I'm guessing that they're just trying to get everybody's favorite in. Yeah, and it seems uh, the hypostasis of the Archons is an earlier text, but on the origins of the world, it's a later text, and it's a big soup. I mean, they're throwing mm. in eros and all these other mm -hmm. texts and everything, and at the end of uh, Origin of the World, it seems to be a universalist uh, message, while the hypostasis of the Archons is just basically the, the root of Norea. Do you think later on they wanted to make sure everybody got saved in Alexandria? 
uh, could well be because you have the same sort of thing in, uh, geez, which one is it? There's one of the apocryphal apocalypses of the apostles. How's that for uh, alliteration? Uh, <laughs> where uh, in one version it says ah, everybody's going to heaven finally. Uh, I like what uh, Crossan says in an interview about that. It's like don't tell everybody, or they'll you know they'll start taking liberties. <laughs> but uh, well, or uh, like in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, nobody's getting saved till everybody's getting saved. It, it seems like uh, you, the more um, like the evangelistic mandate. Gee, I sure wish everybody would be saved. Let's try to save them all merges into the idea of universal salvation, whether you reach them or not. Okay, you know, it's not the will of God that any should perish. So I wouldn't be surprised, though, of course, you do see the opposite in things like the book of Thomas the Contender or Q. Both of them seem to have discernible, detachable, later strata where there is this bitter, resentful um, cursing of those who have not listened to the message. And uh, so it can go both ways, you bastards. You didn't accept what we said. Well, you asked for it to hell with you. But, you know, different people have different religious sympathies, and it can go uh, either way. What about this idea of Jesus being sort of absent, or as you once told me, just sort of tacked on, like in the mm -hmm. Apocryphon of John? I mean, uh, why why was this done if these groups thought thought of themselves as Christian? It's possible they felt they... Uh, had to uh, take refuge in uh, that uh, group that they had to go underground. I mean, we know in uh, some types of Islam and various others, especially in times of persecution, you had to feign conversion. Uh, Muslims uh, and Jews uh, feigning conversion to Catholicism to avoid persecution. It's possible that's what they did, and they figured, well, our the stuff we really believe uh, as Sethians could get into the wrong hands here. Let's make sure that we have a, a, a vestigial reference to Jesus. So they'll say, well, you're kind of weird, but all right, it's Christian. I don't know, because as you say, you do have to explain why is it tacked on. It's it's not like there's a – like a, in the Apocalypse of Adam, which uh, – seems obviously to be a Zoroastrian um, text, that it, it uh, describes the, the Illuminator and uh, how it's, it's really Zoroaster coming in different uh, versions of it, uh, different iterations over the ages as different uh, Persian heroes and prophets and all that. Suddenly, at the end of it, Jesus is one of them. Well, now that seems to me, you know, this is obviously subjective, but that to me reads like somebody that uh, converted, really converted to Christianity, but uh, figured uh, the whole Zoroastrian thing was like another Old Testament leading up to it. So Jesus really has a place in this, uh, or even Melchizedek, the the, the uh, Nagamati text. That kind of looks like these are. Sethians who uh, just found they could graft their faith on to Christianity, and uh, what the heck, why not? And really did believe it. Jesus is a, a second coming of Melchizedek, sure. Whereas in in these, you get the impression that, it, I mean, in the ones I just mentioned, they're not tacked on. It's just another layer added to the, the faith represented there. But in some of them, it's, it seems just tacked on. But you could say the same thing about the epistle of James in the canon. Uh, Jesus is hardly there either. Uh, so who knows? My favorite weird non-Jesus thing in the Nagamati text is the uh, Apocalypse of Paul, where there is no mention at all of Jesus, and Paul is the Gnostic Redeemer. I mean, holy mackerel, you know, what is going on? I, I think the, the Nagamati texts are, are like a fossil record of an incredibly diverse early Christianity. Uh, I think that is underestimated in, in some of the discussions of these texts. They're either not taken seriously by those who are sympathetically interested in them and seem to regard them as some sort of ancient science fiction novels. Maybe it's like 
Dune or something. Uh, whereas, no, I think uh, Pagel is right. These were the scriptures of living religions. People believed and studied this and had a spirituality based on it. And that implies, uh, I mean, what's the Zitzim Laban, as we say, the setting in life uh, from which it emerged? There had to have been living religions or living real Christianities, like Bart Ehrman says, lost Christianities. And uh, we still, I think, are under the shadow of the Eusebian paradigm. Well, of course, the Catholic Orthodox Church is the real thing. These guys are just like flying saucer cults today. They're just a few weirdos out there. And the sheer number of them implies that can't be the case. And the sharing of mythemes and so on among different groups, uh, that implies you got whole families, whole species of early Christianities that died out or got stamped out. And so this is the same uh, reason that you have such different interpretations of the serpent. It seems uh, in the mm -hmm. Apocryphon of John, the serpent is Yaldabaoth, but in Hypostasis of the Archons and Origin of the World, uh, the serpent is Sophia. And if, didn't the Manichaeans believe the serpent was actually Jesus? I don't remember. I do remember, though, Philo says that, uh, and he doesn't elaborate on it, I believe, he says that, yeah, the name of the serpent was Eve. What? I mean, and this, you know, there's no, no possibility of Christian Gnostic influence as a Hellenistic, philosophically oriented Jew. He comes up already with, uh, with the, ba the basic idea. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there were, th this is yet, I mean, I, he wasn't a Christian, but this just uh, fortifies my thinking on this, that, uh, yeah, this wasn't just some wacky brand X version of, of Christianity somebody cooked up in their basement. Uh, you know, this is, uh, these are much more widely known important beliefs and whole families of beliefs. And doesn't this have to do with the the name in Hebrew and Aramaic of uh, Eve and the serpent? That's where this confusion or these interpretations came about. Uh, well, Eve. Well, I'm more used to thinking of Eve as uh, the same as the goddess Heba, uh, and uh, uh, from the the Greeks, and also. Uh, Aruru, from uh, the way back in the Gilgamesh epic, who was the mother of all living. But I, I, I'm not versed enough in the linguistics to know if the link between Eve and the serpent is like an opportunistic pun, like most of the etymological notes in the Old Testament, or if they actually do derive from the same thing. Uh, so I, I don't really know. It's uh, I, I don't know those languages, and so tough to say. And don't some rabbis interpret it as Eve actually having sex with the serpent? Oh yeah, and that's where we got Cain, and uh, and it explicitly says this, but it chalks up all of the children of Adam and Eve to this in uh, the Origin of the World. And uh, yeah, that's uh, and of course, and nor is that a new idea, right? Because rabbis had already said it about Cain uh, and the sons of God, daughters of men. You know, what do you want? There, there it is already. It's it's a very old idea. Yeah, so they were basically just rebooting old texts like everyone else. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they might have had their own spin on it. Uh, they might have, like all of these weird uh, names uh, in, in the Nag Hammadi texts and the fact that they call them the incorruptibility and things like that, it's possible that implies they're allegorizing it somewhat, though they don't uh, go on to explain uh, why in any great depth. Though, on the other hand, the whole thing is kind of like a huge puzzle, like apocalypses, which ultimately come from the same source, uh, where, yeah, we're not making this easy because we're not aiming it at idiots. In fact, if you're an idiot, good luck understanding this, just like the book of Revelation says. Yeah, I think it was Elaine Pagels that said uh, orthodoxy is grade school. The Gnostic text would be grad school. This is for yes. learned people who had a background and who were the, the initiated, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, that that is certainly what they thought. The, the, you, you've got the kid version of it, and I think there's something to that historically. I mean, that's why they stayed in uh, 
like the Valentinians were members of uh, Catholic congregations, which Irenaeus bemoans, because they didn't, why would they even bother staying there if they uh, didn't view themselves as part of the same faith? They just wanted to keep an eye out for people that were ready to graduate too. And then they say, you know, there, there is uh, more to this, just like Jesus with the rich young ruler. He said, uh, well, you know, stage one, right? The commandments. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've kept those all my life. He says, okay, well, if you would be perfect or mature, Sure. I think that's like the Gnostic uh, stance, and um, so, and I think it's uh, there really is something to it because I think like Harnack, he really set me onto this when long ago he said that the lasting legacy of Gnosticism, which has otherwise died out, is the pre-existence Christology, that the Jesus who appeared on earth was a manifestation of a pre-existent heavenly being. He says that must come from Gnosticism, that which is its natural home and context. And I've, I think, yeah, that is correct. And uh, not not only that, but that the uh, once you start looking with those through those lenses you can see that the whole soteriology thing for the uh, plan b for the the sukikoi uh yeah, the pew potatoes as i like to call them uh, that was uh that comes from the mystery religions uh that uh, the idea of uh joining the uh the, the savior in his saving deed by initiation rites that just has to be part and parcel of the mystery religions. And the Gospels, with all the miracles and all that, as Kester and Robinson said long ago, yeah, these are typical aritologies. They're, they're uh, hero tales of the, the gods and the demigods and so on. And that so Christianity as we know it, I think, is a, is a secondary or tertiary fusion of uh, these three items. And that uh, their very existence implies there were older, more sophisticated uh, views, especially with the Gnostic thing, and that we do have it dumbed down, that the Gnostic thing was probably uh, the the earlier, and the, what we have is the Sunday school version, which I don't mean to I don't mean to disparage it, because of course the classic Western Christian story is is a great epic and and uh, much is to be learned from it but i think yeah and so it's a good thing i mean i, I have to admit reading some of these uh, texts is almost like reading an auto repair manual it's uh, <laughs> it's just there's once i was talking to a, a professor up at the uh, unification seminary and he said that he didn't know why uh, they had such trouble getting people interested in the divine principle of uh, their scripture, which is a pretty dry textbook. And I said to him, well, I, I think it is dry and technical. And he, what you need to do is to uh, write up your own gospel, because Reverend Moon did uh, some really fascinating midrashic interpretation of the Old and the New Testament. He would tell his uh, members, here's what really happened with Judas or Jesus and John the Baptist and who was really the mother of uh, Jesus. It was Zechariah the priest and here's how. I mean, fascinating. Fictional, obviously, but uh, fascinating. So I said to my friend, why don't you let me write a gospel as as Reverend Moon says it happened and make a biblical-like narrative? And so uh, I did, and they published it in their uh, in their journal. I don't think anything ever really came from it, but uh, that's I think that is a real problem. The gospels are much more readable than this stuff, as fascinating as it is. Let us now to Mark Cordova and his gnosis, based on his book. The Secret and Truth of the Ages. Oh, and then yeah. tell us about the aeons, and then tell us, in your view, or what you know, what went wrong with uh, the creation of the Demiurge, or God. Okay, here's, here's the thing. I call them eons, then maybe they're supposed to be called aeons, because I don't know the exact, you know, how to pronounce it. I just always said eon. So I'm going to say aeons, because maybe that's right. Here's what it is. An aeon is something you cannot see or touch, but it does exist. And there are many kinds of aeons, like wealth. See, not all aeons are feelings. Most aeons, all feelings are aeons. 
but some aeons are not feelings. Like wealth is an aeon. <laughs> wealth does exist. You can't see it or touch it, but it is an existing thing that's invisible. And here's the thing. Mind is invisible. It's not brain. Brain's material. It has a beginning and end. Mind is eternal. So when, it, when Christ is talking about the Father within me doeth the works, the kingdom of heaven is within you. He's talking about our mind. So everything relative to mind is invisible. Thoughts are invisible. Aeons are invisible. Energies in motion are invisible. Emotions. And also energy is mind. Energy is invisible also. And energy is throughout all material, everywhere. That's why there's a scripture that says, um, spit a piece of wood, I am there. You know, lift up a rock, you will find me there. This is Christ. This is in the Gospel of Thomas. Right, it's yeah. energy. It's mind. Yeah, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. When you break down material, it breaks down, to, it breaks down to nothingness, and all that's left is energy, mind, invisible mind. And listen how that sounds. Invisible visible, invisible, able to see from within. When we think in our head, we see images. That's invisible. We're seeing it from within. Invisibility. That's what invisible is. So all the things invisible are relative to mind. So eons, like, here's the thing. In the eternal realm, before this material universe came to be, because this place is, it's five things opposite to what the eternal realm is. This place is Darkness, time, death, sound, and material. Opposite of material is mind. Opposite of time is eternity. Opposite of sound is silence. Opposite of darkness is light. And opposite of death is life. So, in the eternal realm, when it existed, we all lived there. All of us existed there first, before this place came to be. And so, the eternal opposites over there of eons there's male eons and female eons so like this place over here is yin yang over there it's only yin there is no dead eons there no dark eons only eternal living eons so like i'll give this is a great example i can give right here will will is a male eon it's the first eon of all it's the first power from the father he willed his image he willed the holy spirit the first thought. Will is the first power. And will is a great power. Um, the people of the world have messed up our will by turning it in, combining it with time, where you say, like, I will do this and I will do that. They messed it up. They destroyed it. If we were little children and learned what will really, the power of will, we would use it as will power, but not the way they teach us. We would will things to be instead of want them to be. So here's the thing. Will is the, the first male eternal power. Now, possession or have, to have, that's the female power. Notice that here in the eternal, I mean, here in the material universe, here where we're at, that women have and men want. <laughs> Notice that. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you get that, right? Oh, I'll yes, have to explain yes, that one. Yes, yes. Okay. So in the eternal realm, possession is female and will is male. So, if you're, so now, now when this material universe came to be, then those eons got split. They got split. And now the female eons here are dead material eons. And the eternal living eons are male eternal living eons. So the female eons in the eternal realm are living, but the female eons here are dead. So when the, those eons got split, um, will and, and possession got split, then want became the dead negative eon to will and possession or have need became the dead negative eon to have so it's you want to have right you need to have things that we need to have we need to have then things that we want you know they took away that power will so if we can destroy desire which christ speaks about that all the time to get rid of desire People think it's sex or something or, you know, no, it's, it's wanting. Desire is want. If we could get rid of want, then you will have, or you will have will. If you can get rid of need, then you will have possession. Then you get rid of need and want altogether, and you'll, now you will have willing and you will 
having. Now you have a complete eternal power that you can make things happen for yourself. And notice that the first, the first eons for the Holy Spirit, that's why the, the five-pointed star represents her, is because her first five eons are this. The first one is forethought, which is to think before, to, you know, and then foreknowledge, to know before. Well, in the times when they started, when they were burning us up, because we, we would, we, they would find us, the five-pointed star with the circle, they called that the, the devil symbol. That, was, that means Christ, actually. <laughs> the five-pointed star is the Holy Spirit. The circle around it is the Father. The mother and the Father cross makes the Son, which is Christ, Christ's cross. That actually means Christ. A crucifix is a symbol of death and torture and murder. How could that mean Christ? And there's a dead material body nailed to it. How is that <laughs> good? <laughs> you know, see what I mean? <laughs> yeah. The two symbols are people have been misled so bad about this, you know. And so her first, there's forethought, foreknowledge, indestructibility, eternal life, and truth. And notice that water, which is the essence of the Holy Spirit, and light is the essence of the Father, which light mind, which is all living eternal eons. That's the light. The dark, neons, the dark mind are dead eons here. Darkness, this place of material, the darkness, those are the dead eons. So now notice that water is the only thing in this universe that's indestructible and eternal. Everything else is dissolving away. Is the stars are burning up. The fire that's burning them up is going to burn out. So this universe has an end to it. It's time cannot exist without material, and time has a beginning and an end. And notice that this God, this Archon, this first Archon, which means ruler, he said, "I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end." So he's not the Father. He's not the Father that Christ was, was speaking about. So what? So uh, getting back to the eons of the Holy Spirit, the first two, if you can master those, forethought and foreknowledge. Well, foreknowledge is to know before. So if you can master those here in this place of time and material, forethought, then you can use your mind with your thoughts to create the future or to create what you're going to bring to you from the here and now. Because only from the now can you do this. You can't, can't do it by thinking about the future or do it by thinking about the past. Because those, those two don't exist. Only the now exists. So you think for thought to create your future, to bring it to the now. Because it's always going to be now. When I say future, I mean like tomorrow when it's now, that's the future I'm talking about. <laughs> but you create it from the now. So for knowledge is to know what's going to happen. So now if you know what's going to happen, you can use for thought to change what's going to happen and make it go your way. These are the two powers, most important powers of the, of the Holy Spirit. People don't know about it. When they learn it, people are going to start making things happen like, like you know, and start being happy. Instead of letting the, the world rulers, these, you know, or, or the, the materialists, I should say, control us. We're idealists trapped in these material bodies. Mark, and when, some, and when, you have to, when somebody asks you, well, then who is the Demiurge and the Archons? How do they play into this? What is your answer? It's like this. When this material universe came to be, it came from wisdom. Now, wisdom is the weakest eon of the 12 eternal eons that were brought forth by Christ to create the first perf perfect man whom he named Adamus or Adam. And I'm not talking about the flesh Adam from here in this material universe who was sent here. They were sent here so we could get out of here. I'm talking about the eternal Adam and Eve in the eternal realm. The first 12 eons are grace, form, truth, perception, conception, memory, understanding, love, idea, peace, perfection, wisdom. While wisdom, there's such a thing as foolish wisdom. Wisdom can mess up. And this eon, wisdom, who had a name, Sophia, philosophy, the love of wisdom, she wanted to bring something forth. Christ said, no, no, you don't bring that forth. We're not going to bring that forth. It was material. She was thinking about this material. He says, no, no, no. And so in the eternal realm, the maleness and the femaleness together bring forth things. 
So you have spirit and mind. She did it without her consort. She did it on her own. She turned away and, and she didn't know what would happen. So that's what engendered ignorance. And that's why this material universe is ignorant. So she brought it forth anyways. And when it came forth, this material came forth. And she was ashamed when it came forth. And a soul to this material came forth also. And this soul is this first archon. This first archon. And they, they describe him in the secret book of John that he had the, the, the head of a lion, the face of a lion, and the body of a serpent. But if you look at the Chinese dragon, that's exactly how he looks. And to this day, the Chinese worship this god, this dragon, as their god. And there's dragons all over the planet and all different cultures everywhere. And, and the dinosaurs are all dragons. <laughs> but anyways, getting back, this god, this, this archon, this first archon, he comes forth. He thinks he's the one and only. And he sees all this material and he sees this universe and he thinks he's the one and only. <laughs> so he's... And, you know, he's, he, so he's really happy about this because he, he made, he's the one that created the word God, the meaning of the word God. But then Sophia told him, Yal Tabaf, which means move from here to there. So he moved from here to there. And he looked up as he did it. Now he engendered jealousy because he, now he knows there was someone above him greater than him. And you can read about this in, a, in the beginning of Genesis where he's speaking about in the very, very beginning when he's talking about it in that first paragraph. And he's saying, and it says, and his spirit moved to and fro above the waters. Well, if he's the one and only God and he's the creator of everything and he's the one and only, why is his spirit moving to and fro above him, above the waters? And shouldn't he be the spirit? <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that shows you right there that that's Sophia. She's agitated, moving to and fro above the waters of what she brought forth. She's ashamed. And so when he first came, then because of the system of 12, because of 12-ness, he created 11 other gods. And that's why we have this zodiac and the Chinese zodiac. And everything around, everything here is about 12. It's the system of 12. Because of the system of 12 and the eternal realm, he tried to make a carbon copy of the eternal realm, this material universe. And notice this, the, the galaxy, the galaxy that we live in, I'm wondering, Miguel, if the galaxy is the universe, because science contradicts itself a lot. It, it, it does. Oh, yeah. First, oh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm checking this out where they're talking about, you know, the, the galaxy. And this one lady is speaking about it, and she's saying, our galaxy is so vast, it's so great, so big, we can't even see through parts of it. From, we cannot see out of it. We have a Hubble telescope, the biggest telescope on the outside, orbiting the earth. It's our biggest telescope. It cannot see through our galaxy. Then they go and tell us that there are like 98 billion galaxies. So I'm like, wait a minute. First you're saying you can't see out of our galaxy. Now you're going to try to tell me that there's 98 billion or 90 billion galaxies. I mean, how do you come up with this? And so, so I'm thinking, and then the ancients, a lot of the ancients, when they describe the universe, they say it's a, like a flat pancake, right? And the I Indians, they make a spiral, and they, they start, and they go out, or the circle going out, going out, going out, and they say that's the universe. And I'm like, what if the galaxy is, is the universe? It's big enough anyways, <laughs> you know? I doubt we're going to be going to any other galaxies <clears throat> from here. <laughs> and why would we want to go anyway? Because check this out. The so-called black hole, Okay. This is where the Big Bang has to happen. Here's another contradiction. They say that the universe is expanding. Well, we know that there's a black hole in the center of, of this galaxy, or of every galaxy, if, if that's the case. But we know for sure the center of this galaxy, there's a black hole. Well, that means that the whole galaxy is spiraling back into the black hole because the black hole is it's like a vacuum. It's like... It's like a whirlpool. It's taking the galaxy back in, consuming it back to from where it came. So how could the, the, the universe be expanding if the galaxy is spinning back into the black hole? And then whenever they show us these illustrations or pictures of the galaxy, that black hole is not black. It's extremely bright. 
So what I'm what I'm come to know is that that so-called black hole is actually I call it hole light. That's where the eternal realm. It's the entrance into the eternal realm. And so all this material is going back to from where it came. It's being consumed. Even the light, the false light from from stars, is being consumed. Everything is going back to from where it came. Now they they say it's going into this black. Well, where is it going? They they can't show us where it's going. They don't know. What, they, they they try to come up with these wormhole things, whatever. Well, if you can't see where it's going, that it must be going to invisibility. It must be going to the eternal realm of mind that's invisible. Like our inner mind is invisible. The same thing. So, so getting back to these eons. Now, watch this, Miguel. You look at a, the yin yang symbol. <laughs> that's a six nine, sixty nine. Well, the dark six going down. Those are dead material eons. The, the light nine going up are eternal living eons. And notice how it's swirling. They're swirling in, just like a galaxy, giving us a clue that half of this, because of this dead material place, half of it is negative death. The other half is eternal life. There's where you, you come up to know, knowing about these ages, these certain ages, a material age and an idea ideal age well when there's an ideal age that's the light nine that's we're experiencing the light nine part of the age of the swirling of the galaxy this is a time and material you know now the dark six that's all the dead you know that's a dead negative that's material well the materialists who love god because he's a material soul you know and he's supposed to be good but all these religions that worship him are always killing each other burning people alive raping women like clay i mean this is supposed to be good. You know, and there's three great religions that worship this God, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Well, Peter is the traitor, not Judas, because Peter is the one who denied Christ three times. Those three denials are the three great religions that he brought forth. They call him the Pope. If you read, if people who study the Gnostic scriptures, you will find that Christ never wanted religion to come to be. He speaks against this God, this archon. So religion, see, there's no devil. As far as the Gnostic scriptures goes, God is the devil. And Christ is the one who's good because Christ is the true trinity. But what religion did was try to combine Christ with God saying he is his son. And there's some more contradiction there. You know, God said, so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go back to Genesis chapter 6. And the sons of God came down and took the daughters of men, as many as they chose. Wait, sons of God? See, how is he? <laughs> the Bible's contradicting itself. The materialists are always contradicting themselves. They, you can't lie and it not be seen. This is not the scripture. Know what is before your face, for what has been kept concealed from you shall be revealed. Lies can't. You, they're always, you always come to know a lie. Right. Hey, Mark, <laughs> yeah, Mark, uh, let me st yeah, let me stop you right there. So, um, your book also seems to have a, a more positive view. You think we are getting into an age, maybe of the rise of the Gnostics away from materialism? What's your view, Mark? Yes, I'll show you. Okay, if you go back, notice that. Okay, when they talk about the scientists used to say Cro Magnon Man was here 120,000 years ago, right? I, I heard that all through high school, through college. Then all of a sudden they start changing and saying modern man. Now they say 150 to 200,000. They always change their law, their, what they, according to their agenda. If they know we're going to get ready to start figuring things out, then they're going to change things to mislead us because they want to keep us misled. Well, all these ages, I, come, I break, broke down the ages from 120,000 years ago. That's 30,000 years of peace coming up to 2012, December 21st which started the fifth age. Well, notice that in the Bible, from the beginning, in the beginning, from there, up to the time of the Tower of Babel, where it speaks about, about that the whole earth was speaking one language. There was one king, and he was a good king. Now the whole earth, all of us are speaking one language. That means we're all united. Well, from the beginning of the Bible, up to that point, you'll find no killings no murder, no rape, no, that's nothing bad going on, except for Cain killing his brother, uh, Abel. That's the only killing. 
But then from the time of the Tower of Babel all the way up to now, that's when all the killing starts and then enslaving and murdering. Well, so for, I'd say, 60,000 years, let's see, 90,000 no, 90, years, there wasn't really, we were not killing each other or doing anything like that. It's just these, these archons were coming down, you know, trying to mingle with us, this and that. And notice that from the beginning of the book to, to, the, to the Great Flood, it's thin. That's 90,000 years. And that's how much we don't know about the past. But we see all these great monuments and these incredible things that are built, you know. And, and science tries to say that the aliens did that. We're the ones that did it. We were way more intelligent back then. We're, we're all united. Every, here's the thing. The eons in our brain, in our mind, our brain, were together. So, like, if you have love and hate together, Love is is the opposite of hate, but love is going to overpower hate because love is eternal and hate is not. So if they're all mixed, everything's going to be great. All all everything living will overpower everything dead. So you don't have a choice of of to do deceit. So that means there's nothing to hide in your mind. That means anyone is allowed to read your mind because you have nothing to hide. And if everyone's like that, then all of us could read each other's mind. We could unite our minds and do incredible things. That's why we were flying around in ships. We were underwater in ships. We, I mean, it was great. That was the real utopian society back then. The Atlantis, the, the, the city of Rezan, the, the time of Mu, you know, back then before this God split our brain. <laughs> now, you see what we were doing. You can read it. Come now, let us go down. He's talking to the other gods. He comes down. Look at what they're doing. If we don't stop them, there'll be nothing in mind that they cannot do. He mentions mind. There's another part in there that mentions that he's going to cut our age down to 120 years because we are also flesh. See, this gives you, this gives you the, the clues that we are mind, not just flesh, where God is just a flesh souls, material souls. We are ideal souls. So when we split our brain, now we got left brain, right brain, which actually your left side of your brain is the living side because that's the right hand side. And the right side of your brain is the dead side. That's the left-hand side. It's confusing because they wanted to keep us, have us be confused. So now there's decision. Now that the eons are split, the living ones and the dead ones, now there's a choice. Shall I help this guy? Shall I screw him over? Shall I be nice to her? Shall I dump her? Should I? <laughs> that, that's how everybody thinks <laughs> yeah. now because of the division of the brain. So then that's why we all started Started, started languages from different cultures and then started warring against each other and killing each other. It's been like that ever since he did that to us. Well, getting back to the ages, the question you asked. So now, the, since the, the great flood, the time of the great flood till now, till 2012, that was a material age. Materialists. Uh, uh, the only ambition for anyone was who was the greatest conqueror. Who could kill more people? Who could destroy more? Alexander the Great and the, the great men of old, the men of fame. What? They were famous and great because they killed so many people and murdered and conquered. That was the, the ambition for everybody that it's throughout this material age. That, that's all anybody ever cared about was who's going to conquer who, you know, because of materialists. They care about owning possession, owning land, material thinkers. Well, that age ended 2012, December 21st, and the ideal age, the fifth age, the five point of star age, the age of Aquarius, water is the essence of the Holy Spirit, is here now. Now, watch this. People say, it's getting worse. It's getting worse every day. It's getting, well, the, the materialists are trying all they can to, they can't stop it. But they're trying all they can to keep controlling everybody because of their material ideas, the way they think. But it's an ideal age now. And the, people say it's getting, that, the part that's getting worse is the things they're trying to do. But if you pay attention, it's not getting worse, it's getting better. Because when Christ came to explain this truth to us, that the mind, what, you know, who we really are, that we're not these bodies, we're the mind, spirit, and soul trapped in these bodies that are eternal. That's who we are, not these animal bodies. Well, <clears throat> notice this that um, I got a little lost there. This knowledge, <laughs> see, it's limitless. It's limitless. So 
You could be talking about one thing, and you get get thrown off. Oh, yeah, if, if you oh, would yeah. help me and put me back on track, then I'll be fine. Okay, so, so yeah, what, about, yeah, what age? We're moving forward to what age? Ah, okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can do that anytime, Miguel, because I'll go off. I'll go somewhere else. Okay, so now you notice that when he came to teach us this, that right away, I mean, come on, he was right there, right in the middle of where every, all these materialists were. They could have killed him anytime they wanted, but they could not because he's Christ. They could not get him. So, anyways, from then, I'll, I'll go past the crucifixion and all that other stuff. But from then till now, they tried to suppress that. As they did a good job. They killed all the Gnostics. They burned all the Gnostic scriptures. They destroyed everything. They, the, the Christians who were killed back in those days, they say that the Romans killed the Christians. No. Roman Catholic Church, those Christians killed the Gnostic Christians. The proto-Orthodox Christians of today are the descendants of the murderers who killed the Gnostic Christians, the ones who knew. Because they want us to believe. They don't want us to know. Because when you believe, they can have you to believe whatever, anything they want you to believe. But when you know, we're, it's better to be a Gnostic than to be a believer. So anyway, if you notice from then till now that they're killing all these Gnostics. Well, Mary Magdalene, she, she, she went to France. She didn't get killed. And she taught the Cathar. So then the Cathar learned the Gnostic truth, and four of them escaped because the Inquisition found out about the Cathar, that they had treasure. They went to go kill them. They made a big giant bonfire, told the Cathar, you either become Catholic or we're going to throw you in this bonfire. The, Gnost the Cathar, who are Gnostics, they just walked into the fire. They just walked into the fire like it was nothing. And so the Catholics couldn't find any treasure, but they find this five-pointed star with a like a, a pentacle around it in a cave, which is the exact symbol of the Chrysler automobile. Anyways, getting back to your question. Now, um, notice that they always want to kill these, the people who know. And the symbol, the five-pointed star in the circle, they named that to be the devil symbol, which, of course, it's not. Well, all this bad stuff going on. The worst time since then till now, it was real bad. They were burning people alive left and right. If they just called you a witch, and you don't have to do anything wrong. He's a witch. She doesn't believe in, in God. Burn her alive, you know. All kinds <laughs> like of horror going Python on. Like Monty Python or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So this horror was going on for 2,000 years. And then coming up to World War One and World War Two. now that was horrible. World War Two was horrible, what the Nazis were doing to the, the Jews, you know, and anyone else who wasn't so-called Aryan, you know, that was horrible. Well, think from then till now, how much better it has been getting. If you don't just don't think about the government, what they're trying to do, the governments, but notice that women have become free in this country about a hundred years ago. Before that, there was no freedom of women in this country or any, and, and all the other countries right now, they're still not free. It's only in America where free, women are equal, considered equal to, to men. So see how it's getting better slowly. It's getting better. And all the way up to this point now, I mean, unless something really horrible happens, what's the worst thing that happened was two towers got hit by airplanes, which, of course, we know who did that. But you see what I mean? Yeah. They're not yes. burning people alive right now. Those horrible things aren't going on. So it's passing into that age. And notice this. The 6-9, the when it's turning – like the light of the nine, it's, it's a big, big, it's a, the thickest part that's turning in, but there's a little black and thin line fading out on top of it. You understand what I'm saying? You see it? Yeah, like when the oh, yeah, yin-yang is true. spinning? So that black thin line is the darkness slowly going away as the more light turns. The ideal age comes more and more and more. It's going to get good. It's going to get better. They want to scare us that it's getting bad, it's, you know, <laughs> they, they, they always use, use fear to control us for everything, but it's getting better, we're coming into the age of idea, we need to stop being afraid, you know, and, and, and just take, take control. And the way we're going to do this is with our minds, when we can all, not even all of us, just some of us begin to unite our minds, we can start to read each other's mind. This might sound crazy, but it's a fact. Mind is eternal. Brain is material. Here's how we want us to think of themselves. Your body is a machine. 
Your brain is a computer that runs a machine. Your mind is you at the computer. You know, when you see like a, somebody who's retarded or disabled, they got something's wrong with their brain. <laughs> Why they can't talk right or can't walk right away. Their mind's perfect. It's their brain. Their hard drive got crashed or they got some, some viruses in there. <laughs> That's what it is. And there you have it. You of the broken places. For all subs, we'll continue with the very cool Jay Weedner, author and filmmaker. For everyone else, please subscribe for the full mini course on the Archons. Or just message me if you're in a pinch and just need these revelations for no cost. <laughs>